Welcome to another 2-Bit Da Vinci video. Thanks for all of you who voted in our last poll. And for any of our new viewers, consider subscribing and take part in deciding our future videos. Today we're talking about supercapacitors or ultra capacitors and how they might play a key role in the future of clean energy and transportation. If we want to have a truly clean energy future, we need to both generate electricity from renewable sources like wind and solar and find new ways of storing that energy. In a previous video, we talked about hydrogen as a large scale energy storage solution, as well as large lithium ion battery systems. Now let's see how ultra capacitors can be another energy storage option. First, let's talk about how capacitors work and some of their key benefits and disadvantages. Capacitors build a charge using electrostatic energy, rather like the shock you get after walking on carpet and touching a doorknob. This differs from a battery in which an electrochemical reaction takes place over a much longer period of time. A capacitor can be as simple as two metal plates separated by a dielectric material, or an insulator. An electric charge starts to form on one side of the plate, which induces an electric field, causing the opposite charge to build on the other plate. The primary unit of measure of a capacitor is capacitance, measured in farads. So a one farad capacitor, if charged with one coulomb of charge, would have a potential difference of one volt between its plates. A one farad capacitor would be really big and most applications will typically deal with microfarads or picofarads. You could make a capacitor by simply taking two pieces of aluminum foil and placing them as close together as possible without touching. This is called a parallel plate capacitor and the equation for determining its capacitance is as follows. In this equation, epsilon naught is the permittivity of space, a constant, while k is the relative permittivity of the dielectric material. The k value for air is approximately 1. Now the important aspects are a, the surface area of the plates, and d, the distance between them. a being in the numerator needs to be maximized, while d in the denominator needs to be minimized. This makes sense. If we maximize the size of our aluminum foil, we're going to have a larger surface area and a larger capacitance. Similarly, if we bring the two plates of our capacitor as close together as possible, minimizing D, we will also increase the capacitance of our aluminum foil plate capacitor. The attribute the capacitors are most known for is power density. Not energy density, but power density. To understand the difference between power and energy, let's imagine we have two cars. One car has a small engine capable of propelling the car at 50 miles an hour. The second car is identical, except it has an engine capable of 100 miles an hour. The same amount of energy is required to drive both cars 100 miles. But because the second car is able to make the trip in half the time, it has twice the power. So power is the rate of producing or consuming energy. This is where capacitors shine because they can charge and discharge almost instantly. Now this all sounds great, but there are a few problems. The energy density of capacitors is relatively small compared to lithium ion batteries. Batteries like the ones found in Tesla's Model 3 have an energy density of about 200 watt hours per kilogram, while supercapacitors only come in at around 5 to 10. The second problem is that unlike a battery that mostly maintains its voltage as it discharges, capacitors drop in voltage as they discharge. This means that special electronics are required to control the varying voltage to make it usable. To better understand the differences between batteries and capacitors, let's use an analogy of pumping and storing water. On the left, we have a very big tank with a very small pipe and faucet. On the right, we have a smaller tank, but with a very large pipe and large faucet. If it helps, you can think of the system on the left as a battery and the one on the right as a capacitor. The tank on the left can hold much more water, but it will also take longer to both fill up and drain. In comparison, the tank on the right doesn't hold as much water, but it can empty all of its water almost instantly. The same is true for charging, and this is a fundamental difference between batteries and capacitors. Typical uses for capacitors today include the flash on your camera and also in stereo systems with big subwoofers. Before we continue, we wanted to give a special shout out to all of our patrons on Patreon. Thank you for your support. It goes a long way in making these videos possible. If you're new and like what you see, check out our other videos on this channel and consider becoming a patron. Okay, so batteries currently are able to store much more energy by mass and volume than capacitors. But before we click away and think this video is over, there is a new technological breakthrough that is proving to be a game changer. And that of course is graphene. Remember that single sheet of aluminum foil for our homemade capacitor that we thought was so thin? 
If we zoom in on that to the atomic level, you'll see it isn't actually all that thin. The key to capacitors is to have as much surface area as possible. So the thinner we can get the plates, the greater the energy they can store. This is where graphene comes in. Graphene is a single atom thick layer of graphite, a common form of carbon. Graphite is very common in nature and it's used in pencils, not lead. But if we can shave off just a single layer of atoms from graphite, we get graphene. Before 2004, separating a single layer of a compound was thought impossible due to thermal instabilities that would cause it to break apart. But it turns out that the carbon to carbon bonds in graphene are so strong, it actually is not only possible, but is nearing wide adoption in the industry. Graphene has some pretty amazing properties, like being an amazing electric conductor and being the strongest material ever discovered. It has an ultimate tensile strength of 130,000 megapascals. In comparison, A36 structural steel comes in at 400 megapascals, and Kevlar, the stuff in bulletproof vests, comes in at 375. And did we mention that this stuff is thin and light? Yeah, one atom thin. A square meter of paper would weigh 1,000 times more than a square meter of graphene. If you covered an entire football field in a graphene layer, that graphene would weigh about one gram. So you can just imagine how much more graphene you could wrap into a capacitor than any other material. There is a company in Estonia, an up and coming tech hub in Europe, called Skeleton Technologies, that is currently producing a proprietary curved graphene ultra capacitor. This is pretty amazing stuff. They sell cylindrical ultra capacitors, much like batteries, that you can add in series to achieve any voltage you want. They also sell custom prismatic capacitors based on the customer's use case. This is revolutionary because these graphene ultra capacitors have energy densities of 30 to 100 watt hours per kilogram. They are already selling their ultra capacitors to energy and transportation companies right now, and they are just getting started. If you want to know more about this innovative company, check out this episode of Fully Charged, one of our favorite YouTube channels. This is still the early days, and even further advancements in energy density are sure to come in the next 10 years. If one day capacitors could actually be more energy dense than batteries or even comparable, then they would be the obvious choice to store the electricity of the future. For one, graphene is very abundant as graphite, so we don't need large scale mining operations like we currently do for lithium ion batteries. Also, graphene is just carbon and is very eco-friendly at the end of its life. If these capacitors were built at a large scale, costs could also drop to levels below those of batteries. Charging a hypothetical graphene ultra capacitor EV would take seconds, not hours, and acceleration and performance would be equally impressive. There are some pretty key challenges to graphene that need to be overcome in the coming decade. For one, it's still hard to separate a single layer of atoms, so the challenge isn't in exotic materials but rather the refining process. And it might also prove difficult to transport graphene as a raw material. If we look at something like the fabric loom, which allowed cotton and other materials to be created into sheets and sold as a raw material, we see how an entire textile industry was born. The same might not be true for graphene, which might need to be created on site where it is needed. Of course, this can change, but this is one of those challenges that graphene companies will have to sort out. The next 10 years of graphene will prove to be very interesting, and it could have its place in everything from capacitors to high strength cables and even bulletproof vests. Without looking too far ahead, they also have extraordinary value right now. There aren't any graphene ultra capacitor EVs planned anytime soon, but they might appear in cars in the coming years as a supplemental energy source. For one, consider regenerative braking, which allows EVs to regenerate electricity when slowing down, rather than waste it using friction brakes. With batteries, the rate of regenerative braking is limited to how fast the batteries can charge. If we add an ultra capacitor into the equation, the brakes could more completely charge an ultra capacitor, which could slowly send electricity back to the battery pack. The same is also true for rapid accelerations, when an ultra capacitor could provide that fast surge of power needed in short bursts. Finally, ultra capacitors could also help with recharging times. Add a five kilowatt hour ultra capacitor to an EV and you could get 25 miles of range in just seconds. For the energy grid, they can provide the same benefits by filling the peaks in demand and production. Wind turbines are typically speed limited, but an ultra capacitor could help collect peak input generation. Capacitors could also be charged during off peak times and ready for discharge during unusual energy peaks. These fluctuations are usually what make the detractors say that green energy sources aren't practical, but capacitors could change all that. In general, any situation that needs high power input or output, 
that is, a large amount of energy over a very short period of time, just think ultra capacitor. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, hit that thumbs up button. If you loved it, please consider subscribing and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of our future videos. We run polls to see what our viewers want to see, and we're serious about covering what is of interest to our viewers. So join us. We have tons of future videos planned in the coming months. We're Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you for watching.